This is the War Room Roundtable podcast, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant businessmen and women on the planet, hear their stories, and get the most important business lessons they've learned on the road to success, and get exclusive advice on how to implement their successes into your life and business. The War Room Roundtable is brought to you by your hosts, Jason Miller, CEO of Strategic Advisor Board, and Philip Lanos, CEO of Own the Rhythm, and former podcast host for Entrepreneur and Inc. Magazine. Welcome to the War Room, Dr. Eric Holzapple. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. You know, we start this podcast off in the same way, and I always love the answers because this is the, the, the most unique part of the show. And that is, do you yourself come from a family of entrepreneurs, creative professionals? You know, my dad was uh, very entrepreneurial, though he's a school administrator. So I'd have to say most of the answer, that's no. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Because I'm trying to I'm trying to connect the dots here, right? Uh, and there's always a story behind how this happens. Because from what I get in my notes, you are an entrepreneur and a very successful developer as well. And I imagine that relates to real estate. Yes. Yeah, that's how I got my start. Yeah, you have the doctor in your name as well. So there's an entire story being told with just those facts there. So how does that tie back to sort of your origin story, your upbringing? Yeah, in a couple of ways. Um, well, I was always entrepreneurial. We started. I started in a family business, and just was you know business was how I got my successes. And I went on to school mostly to learn to teach and do other those those other things. That business was more of a uh, just an instinct for me. And then also, I just wasn't very fulfilled. You know, I was a CEO in my twenties and very successful. But I wasn't very happy. I was very stressful. I wasn't very healthy. And my going back to get at a doctor, it was part of that search, was part of that search for finding meaning and, you know, higher purpose in life was kind of how that happened. Interesting. And how did uh, going into economics sort of inform your decisions to after post, post-education? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the university is a pretty bureaucratic system. So I loved the teaching and I loved the concepts, but I was too entrepreneurial for to, to live <laughs> and survive in that system. Uh, so, but, but I got a lot out of it. I mean, I love, I love economics. Okay. Now I see this, uh, those who are listening won't see this, but those who are watching the video will, you have living in the gap behind you there, yeah. right? It, I would be remiss if I didn't ask what that was about. Yeah, the gap is that little space where one thought stops and before another one starts. We have some 6,000 thoughts a day. And I have just found that peace and joy and happiness come in the gaps. They're they're in presence. They're not in our brain and our thoughts. So, I mean, we have thoughts and we need to be able to do that and, and, and figure things out and whatnot. But that's where stress and anxiety lives, too. So if I want to come at at life to be in a little more uh, a little calmer, a little more joy, then I have to find some of those gaps. I see. Yeah. And these uh, these this ability to find these gaps is this sort of tied to the work that you're doing today with your book and the work that is known as profit with presence and one yeah. of the twelve pillars. Yeah, it is. It's uh, it's all to do with that, and it can, you know, it can. It's through mindfulness can come about through formal meditation practice or extended time in nature or some other means, but somehow to get the brain to slow down so that we create some gaps. In it. I love this, uh, Jason. You yourself own multiple companies. Talk about needing gaps in between trying to manage everything. Can you relate to any of this uh, this uh, this ideology? <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, the, you know, a lot of people use the term busy and, you know, I hate that word. Um, That's such a horrible word to use. Um, I'd rather use the word productive, but in smashed in between productivity is a place where there is some serenity and you have to find it. 
Mm-hmm. And I like that you've coined this like living in the gap thing. I mean, that's uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great way to look at every day what we do to just stop for a second instead of that freight train that's going, you know, a hundred miles an hour, constantly moving all the time, stop and let yourself fall in the gap. I really like that. I think that's a, uh, I think that's a great, a great practice. If we mean the same thing. Um, it sounds it sounds like we do. You, you know, know I, I, mean? I love the tie to the intuition and the creativity. Yeah, that's yeah. really where it, where it comes from. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. we, we live our lives in this hustle and kind of chaos world that we live in. And, you know, I've always said, I mean, we're still in a little bit of an angry world yet um, coming out of some of the things yeah. that yeah. have happened over the last few years. And, you know, in the gap kindness is 100% free. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good place to go and hang yeah. out for a little while. <laughs> oh, oh, totally. Yeah. We can use a little big cup of kindness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now you work with a lot of CEOs, uh, Eric, correct? Yes. Now, that's a whole different type of business model, right? Uh, sure, some people go B two B and they want to talk to other CEOs. To hopefully, bridge services with each other or serve just specifically one mm-hmm. one aspect of an operation. Mm-hmm. But you holistically work with CEOs. What are some of the challenges that your business model faces these days, and how you're overcoming them with like the work that you do? Because I imagine working holistically with a CEO is a world of different from providing them marketing services. <laughs> yeah, I would say, I mean, the the real, one of the real reasons that we do a lot of work with CEOs is to try to tip corporate culture is that we've had a lot of people come out of our programs and they're really uh, enthused and energetic, but then they go back into the exact same environment they were in before and it's hard to maintain practices and, and a new mindset if you're surrounded by the old things. So what we found and what we, we have a company here called LC Real Estate Group, and what we've done here and what we found is if you can, if you want to impact culture, it really has to come from the top down. So the CEO has an option. I mean, and first we say to the CEO, you know, don't don't share this until you instill it in yourself, you know, until you've got it, until you've got some maintenance of a practice yourself. But the CEO just has such an access to guide the culture of a company that if they want to uh, share and instill, like we have a, a vision statement here, mindfully creating community, which is just in the the management team came up with it, but it's just transformed the way we do business. Uh, is that everybody's on a nonprofit board? Everybody's contributing. We're doing. They're packing up coats and boots now. Anybody in uh, in our town that's on uh, free and reduced lunch gets coats and boots for before the winter comes in. And we're just doing a lot of those things. Uh, that just changes the whole conversation and the meaning and the purpose of the company from just being a profit-driven organization to being a purpose-driven organization that makes a profit as the result, you know, of of providing good services and making a difference for people. And I just find that it makes a huge difference for every employee, whether, you know, not everybody's meditating and doing all those things, but it chipped the culture to be more mindful, more caring, more kind, uh, and it's a fun place to come to work. Interesting. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I can't think of a single company I ever worked for that made that an initiative that didn't say, hey, but do it on your own time. <laughs> not not like, hey, this is part of the activities of what we do as an org. Is that well, sort of what you're talking about? Well, and why can you do that? It's because mindfulness, if you had it said in a word, is focus. And if you focus, you can get more done in less time. How much time do we waste or you walk down and you see people on their Facebook page or they're texting and they're doing all these things? If you can be more focused, we give a half hour a day if somebody wants to take a mindful walk or we do a yoga class here once a week and do those kind of things. If you're focused, you can get so much more done that uh, the mindfulness is a real investment. And it also brings everybody a little closer together in the company. So we find that uh, production is up. 
from those you things. Speak to, you speak to something that's come that's come up in the show quite a few times, and uh, I know Jason knows it because he's talked about it too. Even in some of his companies, he says, you know, uh, and I'll speak for you here, but you can correct me, Jason. It's, uh, you know, if you can get whatever you need it done in three hours instead of eight hours and you want to go play around a golf, if you really took care of business, I don't have a problem with that. And that seems to be the best way because really how much, how much productivity and how much output do we really have in us each day? Right. About yeah. three or four hours. <laughs> Tops, right. Tops. Yeah. A lot less than most people think. And yeah. But I think a lot of companies have, you know, they have or they're starting to come around to this idea of the corporate cubicle isn't the best way. I mean, I, I live in Boulder and it's like corporate central out by IBM. And now you see a lot of those buildings, they're empty. <laughs> They've yeah. just stopped all that and. And they have like caved these big companies down into 1500 square feet. And, you know, they're letting people work from home. It's a whole different conversation of accountability, but that's a different thing. It is absolutely uh, shaping the culture of the new work environment for sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm pretty passionate about it myself. I've always been sort of a problem solver whenever I was a part of an organization. And even now as a freelancer, it's the same thing that I do. You know, uh, when I work with contractors, I'm still the one trying to strategically understand the problem. So I think this is a really healthy and necessary element to be bringing to the industry and to CEOs. Uh, I'm curious if you had a bottom line piece of advice from all the work and experience you've collected over the years to leave behind for CEOs or entrepreneurs, what is your go-to no matter what? Sort of an axiom, if you will. Oh, I would say it's your, your mindset rules. You got to get your mindset right. You know, you have to have your own mindset right before you're able to help anybody else. That's, that's, Can you sort of elaborate on maybe one or two points for people who, because everybody hears that yeah, word thrown around. Sure. It's kind of a buzzword, right? Well, uh why do we do all this stuff? We do these things to be happy, right? So we're in a society that tells us to go out and do these things, go to the right schools, get the right job, work, you know, 80, 90 hours a week, blah, blah. And then someday you get to be happy. <laughs> well, my experiences with a lot of successful people, including myself, is when I get there, I just want more. I constantly, it's the next thing. And actually in the science shows that if I can turn that around and just be happy now, that I'll be more successful. Because if I'm not happy, I'm unhappy. If I'm not content, I'm discontent. Uh, and who do, would you rather deal with? Somebody that makes you feel better when you talk to them on the phone or somebody that's, you know, waiting someday to be happy. So the way I frame it is it's not that we don't want things. I mean, I love houses. I love to ski. I love to do all the things. But I just don't, I just don't uh, believe anymore that that my happiness is over there. Then, if I like, oh, I'll give you a great example: is golf. I'm going to go play golf this afternoon. You know, I used to go out and say, you know, I'll go out and then I'll play a good round of golf. I'm in a good mood. I play a bad round of golf. I go home and kick the dog. You know, yell at my wife, whatever. Now I say, no, I got to bring happiness to the golf course. If I can be happy when I go out there, then the first errant shot or something's not going to ruin my whole day. It's just a stupid golf ball that went left, you know? Can I be, can I bring happiness to the situation versus trying to get that from the situation? It's a total mindset shift that, uh, I don't know, change your life, you know? Just that one simple thing or gratitude. I mean, the science on gratitude is irrefutable. I start looking for things to be grateful for rather than looking for things to be agitated for. And we find what we look for in life. You know, it's out there. That's true. I can think of a number of times I've been upset only to look at the fact that I have three computers and a, a puppy and, you know, I have uh, someone I love and I'm like, yeah, I can sit here and totally focus on this one thing that ticked me off. Or I can just be like, wow, uh, 
I live by the beach. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. You know, like yeah. have some perspective. <laughs> I'd rather I'd I'd call the second guy. You know, <laughs> that's the guy I'd call, and that's the guy who gets the call is the guy that gets the business. That's what hey. I think. That's a good way to look at it, right there. <laughs> there it is. How to get the business? How to get the call? Be, oh, some, be someone that makes you feel better when you talk to them. You know, yeah. I think no. I no, you're right. You're right. I mean, if half of us uh, spoke to our friends, right? That's that old saying. If half of us spoke to our friends, the way we speak to ourselves at times, we'd have no friends. And so Could be. we'd actually yeah. we'd actually go defend our friends against that person that speaks like that. Right. So it's Probably just one right. of those things, man. I, I love that because uh, I, I could use more of that myself. Uh, I think it's a solid win in terms of bottom line advice. That being said, uh, I want to take a short break to give a shout out to somebody that's making this conversation possible because sure. uh, this otherwise it wouldn't be happening. And that is uh, Terry uh, with uh, Scale with Social Selling. He's got this program that he put together where they can help you hyper target and actually hyper book the ideal people that you want to be speaking to. For example, if this podcast was not a business podcast and you were like, I want a business podcast only to find you have 12 of these that are not business podcasts. You've got a romance podcast, a, a murder, death, mystery podcast. You're like, why are these things on my calendar? Yeah. That's a real thing that many people have in business where they're talking to people that wouldn't be their customers, whether even if they could and tried, mm -hmm. right? And so Terry has sort of systematically created a system where he can help guarantee, which is hard for a business to do that these yeah. days, uh, the prospects you're looking for. So you just have to go to try.scalewithsocialsellingsystem.com and tell them the war room sent you and uh, they'll give you 20% off on that first look. So coming back, to what we're doing here. Uh, I'd love to give you the floor as well, uh, Eric, and have you share with people where they can connect with you yeah. and get in touch with you. The best way is on our website, livingInTheGap, spelled out, dot org. All of our workshops are on there, information. We have a book coming out called Profit with Presence. You can find there. That's uh, It'll be launched in the first quarter, coming out in publication. Uh, anything to do with our workshops, we have a, you can sign up there for a monthly free newsletter. Anything. There's also free resources on a 21 day uh, meditation, learn, learn meditation. There's all, you know, you want clips on if you want to learn a little yoga, those kind of things, free resources. So, yeah, man, you know, I have, I have genuinely found out that the days I actually stretch first thing when I wake up and I actually take the time to just kind of, you know, I find that it's easier as I'm growing into my later 30s that if I just <laughs> do that little bit, and just you know, lubricate the joints a little. My day seems to go a lot better. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, before we go on to some of the latter half of the show, I want to check in with Jason and sort of hear his reflections on what we've talked about so far. Yeah, I, I think this this is yet another one of those topics that, you know, we need to be shouting about right? Yeah. This is one of those shout about topics right now. Um, and, it, and it's because of where we are. Um, I, I think as a workforce, we found ourselves or, or folks that are in the workforce in the daily grind of it all. Um, leadership has to learn how to change, right? And, yeah. you know, it, it does, you can, all the excuses and well, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and this is the way it's always been done. And, you know, this is the way I know how to do it. And it's my way or the highway, all these. That's great if you want to be bankrupt here pretty soon because it's coming, right? Um, the, the, the economics of it, right, are, are pretty clear of the economics of the human dimension, that are working inside of companies today. Um, Cause I have two daughters that are working inside of companies today. So not that I know at all, but I get to hear about it. And it's like, yeah, you know what? They're going to leave and go somewhere else real soon because they can, because mm -hmm. they can, there's plenty of jobs. There's plenty of availability out here in the workforce. And you're either the company that adapts, like it or not, adapt to the way it is today, 
because it's not going to change and we need to embrace it and move forward. That's the way I really look at it. And, Mm -hmm. and there again, as business owners, got to live within that gap, right? (laughs) I just Uh, love that saying. It's a really good saying. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. Uh, With that said, I think it's a, it's a, prim and proper to start going into something that I, I'd really, I'd really love to know, you know, what would you say has been aside from like mindset, what you talked about, what has been the key uh, pattern that you've seen? Uh, Cause we talked about corporate culture mindset. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, is there something on the table there that most CEOs that you've worked with sort of, you can almost spot immediately uh, is it, is it, we're talking about that pessimism or is there, is there something else that you spot immediately with a CEO with, before you, before you even get into how yeah. their business is running and you're just like, like, I can already see this a mile away. I'd love to know about that because only someone who's in your position working holistically with CEOs has the pattern recognition for this. Stress and anxiety. This runs us, runs amok, you know, we're just stressed. Particularly, I mean, we were before the pandemic and everything, and then particularly, you know, worse since then. People are really stressed, even though they're materially successful and have the title and the stuff, they haven't found the peace and the joy that should come with success. You know, that real reward. What I love most about the answer isn't just what you said but how you said it, if people haven't been paying attention and I love doing this on the show as I'm a keen observer of human behavior. And if there's one thing you've been the entire podcast is very even keel, very engaged, very calm. And even the way you said that, like people are just stressed, man, you know, <laughs> there's no judgment. Yeah. It, it's as plain as it is a fact, you know, it's, it's just a fact. And I can imagine people come to you. Oh, it's not working. And it's this and that you're like, all right. And what we're going to do first is breathe. Yeah. <laughs> Sit down, Junior. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Th- thank you. I just, I just wanted to drive that point home uh, before reminding people that they can go check out what you're doing again. Uh, the, the link, the link was at livinginthegap.org. Was that's that it? right. Yeah, it's a nonprofit. Living in the, livinginthegap.org. Right on. Yeah. Okay. With that said, I believe we're here for the grand finale. Is that all good with you, Jason? Yes, we are. All right. I'd love to hear your answer on this. Uh, Based on everything we talked about, uh, who would you have loved to have had here, uh, uh, Eric, today in this conversation, in this room, uh, from any point, place, and time? And why would you be inviting them to this conversation? You know, today I would invite William Waddles who was the author of a book called The Science of Getting Rich. I think it was published in 1908 that talked Mm -hmm. about these concepts uh, that science is proving up now in 2023 and beyond or trying to. Uh, And he just came up with these concepts of, you know, the same things that we're talking about today of how you can have everything, you know, material wealth, but it starts with inner wealth, you know, spiritual wealth. And how those can come out and give you material wealth as well. So I think he'd be a great one to have on today with us, William Waddles. You know, I, I I've read that book and and I agree with you. That is, uh, it's rare that I hear the name, so I think it's interesting that you bring it up. Yeah. Uh, reminds me that I need to go take another look at it again. It's is good. That, uh... <laughs> so it's a quick read, and it's it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, man. No, well, for me, I can't thank you enough for bringing some zen uh, to <laughs> to the to the show. And uh, you're the first one to do it without uh, without any bells and whistles. It, it really is. Look, I, you're an entrepreneur who's just doing everything they can to help others while staying as calm, cool, and collected mm-hmm. as you can, because that is the goal. That's how you collect, by staying calm, cool, and collected. Yeah. Uh, that's at least what I got from this. Uh, it is tradition around here for Jason to close us out, so I'll turn it over to him. But, man, what a great conversation having one with you. Thank you. Yeah, Eric, uh, very calm and collected conversation. That's actually really refreshing because <laughs> it's we live in a world that everything's like very excitable, right? And moves very quickly. And, and you can just, you're, you're very calm in the chair, 
That's very noticeable. Thank so you. thank you for taking uh, the time to spend a little time with us today and share some great value with our audience. We appreciate it. I appreciate being on. You guys are doing good work. Keep it going, man. Thank hey, you. There it is. Cheers. All right. Cheers. All right. Thanks for listening to the War Room Roundtable with your hosts, Jason Miller and Philip Lanos. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advisement on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates. And always remember, if you can dream it and believe it, then you can go achieve it. We'll see you in the next episode.